Welcome to worship at Incarnation. Again, we are celebrating ourselves as a church without walls. And what a critical time for us to be that in this world. Uh, this past week, I was watching the, the funeral service for George Floyd. And at the end of that service, they had a stand for eight minutes and 46 seconds. The time it took for that officer to kneel on the neck of George Floyd and for his life to be ended. It was a very poignant moment. At the end, the Reverend Al Sharpton came on. He said this, um, there was plenty of time, wasn't there, for them to rethink what they were doing. And then he just ended up with this. What are you going to do with your time? What are you going to do with your time? Today our focus is on the grace of God, but it's a grace of God not just as we receive his gift, but a, that extends us back into the world for acts of justice. And so you'll hear Pastor Joel preach on the uh, text from Amos 5 on God's call from justice that has been part of our DNA from the very beginning of the church. But today we're going to begin with some opening words of confession, because in our own way, we've all participated in making the world as it is. So I'd like you just to take a breath, ironically, right, given that George Floyd can no longer breathe, but I want you to take a breath. And I want you to be able to center yourself and be prepared to receive and to say these words with me as we join in this opening confession. Join me in these words. You asked for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life that you might work through me. I gave a small part that I might not get too involved. We pause now for a moment of silent confession. Join me in these words. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you, only when it is convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Amen. Friends in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins and the riches of God's grace. The grace of God has been given to you. Thanks be to God. Amen.
moment, you're going to hear from Megan Shorenstein, who's a member of this congregation and a mom. And she's going to do a little reflection on John 11. John 11 is the text where uh, Jesus' good friend Lazarus has died. And there's that just intensely poignant moment, the shortest verse, I think, in all the scriptures, that just said simply this, Jesus wept. One of the beautiful things about that is that we begin to know something about the heart of God just because of that particular text. So listen to Megan as she explains that to her kids. Jesus wept. Growing up in my ELCA church, the same church denomination as Incarnation, I remember this verse from a trivia contest during confirmation. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, depending on what version of the Bible you are looking in. Why did Jesus weep in this verse? Jesus wept for his friends, Mary and Martha, on the death of their brother, Lazarus. Jesus showed up for his friends. Jesus showed us that when your friends weep, you weep. Jesus showed us how we can respond when others hurt. Jesus modeled for us the importance of showing up and sharing in suffering. We can think about the many times we have been upset. You feel your parents aren't listening to you. You ask for a snack and mom says to wait while she quickly does one more thing. It doesn't feel quick enough. Your brother or sister keep taking your toys, knocking over your Legos that you are building with. You cry. You get upset. You may even hurt someone. Jesus wept. Acts of nature happen. Tornadoes, fires, earthquakes, things are destroyed. Lives are lost. Human destruction occurs. Jesus wept. But then what? Jesus wept. We wept. When sad and scary things happen, this is a chance for us to rebuild stronger. Mom gives you a snuggle as she gives you a snack. You share a sweet moment together. You take a time out, a time to regroup. Together, you and your brother or sister rebuild the Legos. You can make a bigger, stronger. Jesus wept. When acts of nature occur, we rebuild. We come together. We clean up. I remember a time growing up where a storm came through. When the storm ceased and neighbors came out of their houses, together we picked up the branches, trimmed the trees, reassessed everything. Just this week, a friend of my daughter's lost her house to a house fire. People came together. They raised money. They spread the word. We support others. Jesus wept. When our neighbors are hungry, we help feed them. Through Ralph Reader Food Shelf and Feed My Starving Children, through pop-up food gathering sites, through little lending library pantry sites, through monetary donations, through prayer. When destruction happens, we come together. We get our brooms and hammers and clean up. When the power is out at church, we come together to move chairs to a location with light and continue our services. Jesus wept. This has been a tough week, a tough month, a tough year. COVID is happening. School was moved to home. Scary and sad things happen. Your parents may seem stressed or worried, our schedules and routines are thrown off. Jesus wept. Just like us, I imagine Jesus wept happy tears, sad tears, scared tears, worried tears, nervous tears. Jesus shares in our emotions. What can you do today? How will you respond? Jesus loves you and he loves your neighbors. Jesus shows up. How will you show up? Amen. Hello, Incarnation. It's me, Pastor Joel, here. Um, as uh, we enter now into our sermon time, I love the way that, that Megan reminded us over and over again that Jesus wept, that when bad things happen, when sadness occurred, Jesus wept. And I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus weeps for our nation, that Jesus weeps for George Floyd's life and for the life of so many other African Americans who have died at the hands of police, at the hands of fear, at the hands of, of white supremacy that has ruled this nation for far too long. I know that Jesus weeps. Today in our sermon series, we're supposed to begin a sermon series on Renew Your Life, a COVID version, um, talking about those themes again, about grace and possibility and paradox and rest. 
Um, but knowing what's happened in our world over these last two weeks, I'm shifting gears a little bit. And so whereas grace is an important topic for us, grace is also a sense of, of what justice might look like. And so for me, I'm going to focus on this topic of justice. And to do so, I'm going to look at a chapter in the book of Amos, uh, one of our minor prophets, uh, chapter 5. And so if you have your Bible, if you need to pause the video, um, go ahead and do that and find uh, the book of Amos. I'm going to be bouncing around in that chapter, um, so feel free to keep that open um, and follow along with me as you can. Uh, As we prepare to hear God's word, uh, let's say a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and enliven our eyes, enliven our lives, open our eyes and open our hands that we may see you, that we may hear you, that we may act in this world for the sake of others. Be with us now as we reflect on your word and what it means for us today. Amen. So just to kind of get us started in the book of Amos, it's helpful, I think, to know a little bit about the background of Amos, the context in which he comes from, because it's pretty similar to the context in which we live today. Amos was a prophet who originally lived in the southern kingdom. So this is in about 750 BCE. Um, The southern kingdom was Judah, and he was called to go to the northern kingdom, Israel. At this time, Israel was a... uh, a country that dominated the Middle East. Um, They were a superpower uh, at this time. They were fighting back against the Assyrians who uh, were another superpower at the time. They were beginning to make inroads into their territory and beginning to take over different lands there. Um, They were a wealthy country um, where the rich continued to get more and more rich, um, especially as it's described in the book of Amos. But oftentimes they would become more rich at the expense of the poor. And this is why Amos is called to go to the country of Israel, to speak out against these people. Specifically, what would be happening is in their cities, people would gather together at the city gate. And this is where they would uh, dispute all their legal matters. And what happened was many people um, would give bribes to other people in order to be witnesses against somebody or um, to, to vote in a specific way so that a person who was already in power could gain more power or to gain more wealth. And this is why Amos is there. And so this is what Amos says in, in verse 12, if you have your Bibles open. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You afflict the righteous who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. That's, that's what he's talking about here. That, that this is what's happening. People are taking bribes and they're pushing away the needy at the gate. Uh, In verses 10 and 11 kind of sets this up. In verse 10, it says, They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. What the rich are doing is they're taking the food from the poor. They're taking their grain from them. They're, they're taking their housing from them. They're, they're making these plans, these city plans, in order to prevent them from living in different areas. They're taking vineyards from them, a place where they can have wine, which is a, a status of wealth and prosperity. They're taking these things uh, from one another. And you may notice in that first, in verse 10, how it talks about how they abhor the ones who are speaking against them, that, that there are some who are speaking out against them. And maybe what that gets you to think is, well, maybe Amos is exaggerating what's going on here. That maybe not all of the rich people are doing this, that, that it's only a select few who are, are making bribes to one another, that maybe it's It's just a small population of people. Why is Amos getting so upset about a handful of people who are abusing this system? Shouldn't he be glad that so many people are living in prosperity? You'd be right to be skeptical of that. Prophets are known for exaggerating the truth in some way. It's true. It's what prophets do. They exaggerate things. There's a reason behind it, though. 
The reason behind it, though, is, is because they know that even those who stand by, who are complacent in what's going on, are not doing what's right. That is their obligation to stand up to those who are being corrupt. That is their role to stand up as ones who have privilege, as ones who have power, as ones who have wealth, and to stand up against those who are trying to take those needs from other people. But the problem is, is that too many people are being complacent. Too many people are merely standing by and not using their voice, not using their privilege, not using their power to speak against the injustices that are happening. You can think of it this way, that as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That that is exactly why Amos is so angry and so upset. Because he sees the injustices that are occurring. And he knows that it is a threat to justice everywhere. That there is a reason for him to get angry. And he wants the people of Israel to be angry with him. Abraham Heschel uh, writes this about prophets. Above all, prophets remind us of the moral state of people. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. I'm a white male. And while I abhor white supremacy, I know that I have benefited from white supremacy, that I have privilege that other people don't have, that my complacency in this this situation that we're in, this complacency of racism, of complacency of, of this society and the structures that have allowed uh, the injustices to occur to African Americans is sinful on my part. And for that, I confess to God for those moments of complacency. I don't know if you read this article in the New York Times. It was written by a professor and a research fellow from the University of Minnesota. But in it, they write about how uh, black families in Minneapolis who make $167,000 a year are less likely than white families who make $42,000 a year to get a home loan. Let me say that again. In Minneapolis, black families who make $167,000 a year are less likely to get a home loan than white families who make $42,000 a year. As a white person, that injustice is unacceptable. That that privilege that has entered into our community is something we should be outraged against. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. That is what Amos is speaking of here. So what then does justice look like? What then is this, this saving grace that Amos wants the people of Israel to know? Well, he goes on and talks about in verses 4 and verse 6, he tells people to seek the Lord and to live over and over again. Speak the Lord that you may live. And then in verse 14, he changes gear a little bit and tells us what it looks like to seek the Lord. In verse 14 and 15, he says, Seek good and not evil that you may live. Simply what that means is that for us to seek the Lord, it means to seek the good and not the evil. This is what Amos is speaking of. And, and to have justice within the gate. He says that in verse 15, that that is what we are to seek after. Now, maybe you saw the ABC special on Tuesday night, like I did, called America in Pain. And within that special, I, I was moved almost to tears hearing of uh, the ABC correspondents, the African-American correspondents, express their own stories of racism and, and to share how uh, they have been oppressed by police over and over again. I think what was most gut-wrenching to me was when they did an interview with a number of moms and, and they discussed with them this, this question of, when did my baby become a threat to you? 
at this question that is out on, on social media posts of when did my baby become a threat to you? It's heart-wrenching to think that, that somehow another human being, one who is loved by their mother, one who is loved by the one who created them, is a threat to us, is a threat to me. That's not seeking the good. That's seeking the evil. I love the way that they ended that program, that they started to share stories of hope. And one story that, that drew me in the most was a story of a sheriff in Flint, Michigan. Maybe you saw this too, of, of when he took off all of his riot gear, laid down his baton, and had all the other officers behind him doing the same thing. And he began to talk to the protesters and sharing with them that, that this is why he was here. He wanted to have a parade, not a protest. And, and then he asked them, what do you want me to do? and they started chanting, walk with us, walk with us, walk with us. And so he did. Seek the good, not the evil, so that you may live. This is our call, to seek the good and not the evil in this world. Now, oftentimes that may be that we may be labeled as extremists, especially maybe right now, Maybe some of what you see on TV, you dismiss what's going on, calling them extremists. And and maybe that's right. But maybe we need to reconsider what the word extremist means. Too often it is labeled as this negative connotation. But what if we began to see it as a positive one? In his letter from the Birmingham City Jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reflects on how this movement that he started, this nonviolent protest movement, has been labeled as an extremist. And at first he feels disappointed in it because he knows how easily that can be dismissed. But then he goes on to say that he has gained a great deal of satisfaction as he's dealt with it, as he's thought about it. And, And he says, was not Jesus an extremist of love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them who despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I can do none other. So help me God. Dr. King goes on, so the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of an extremist we will be. Will we be extremists for hate, or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? Friend, Amos was labeled as an extremist. Maybe some of those people who are protesting right now, you label as an extremist and dismiss them and dismiss their movement. But friends, it's time for us to act. It's time for us to consider ourselves to be an extremist. And so what might that extremist look like? Again, at the end of chapter 5 and verse 24, Amos gives us that answer. He says, but let justice roll down like a mighty water. Let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. Those are the things that we ought to be about, about justice and righteousness. And justice is about fixing the legal system. Justice is about taking action so that people do not have to live in fear anymore of being pulled over by a police officer, but that people can work together, that they can not create protests, but parades as they walk with one another. And this word righteousness, it's not about being made right before God, as so often we assume in the Christian setting. Really what this word is talking about is is combining two opposing ideas at the same time. It combines the idea of justice and charity at one time. Here's what I mean by this. Suppose I give you $100, and maybe you are entitled to that $100. Maybe I'm buying something from you and you're entitled to give it. That is giving it to you as an act of justice. On the other hand, maybe I give you the $100 because I know that you have a need that has to be met. And so you receive that $100 as a gift of charity. In our minds, justice and charity are two opposing ideas. Sedekah combines them into one. 
Sedekah means that because you are in need, I have a legal obligation to meet that need. Let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream is this legal obligation that we have to give to others. Sometimes that looks like giving of physical items. This past Thursday, uh, some of us were able to gather together a group of items to bring down to St. Paul to help those who are now living in food deserts because of the riots that have happened. Uh, to, to give to our sister church, Bethlehem Lutheran at the Midway, who has set up an aid station, that that is an expression of righteousness being uh, flowed out into the community. Now, maybe that's one way that you can act. We're doing it again this coming Wednesday, and I invite you to come out to the church to drop off items between 9 and 3 o'clock uh, so that we can again give more uh, to those who are in need in St. Paul. But it doesn't just stop at giving of need, of physical needs. What Sedekah also entails is, is about the societal structures that have created disparity and inequality within this world, within the community that we live in. Sedekah makes us have this legal obligation to, to act, to use our voice, to speak out against those injustices that have happened. And so maybe what that looks like for you is if maybe it means writing a letter or contacting your state representative uh, to begin those words of action um, to create, to recreate this broken system that we live in in the state of Minnesota. Friends, we have an opportunity to act. We have an opportunity to rewrite the history that we live in. That is, as Amos tells us, but let justice roll down like the waters. Let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. We can join in on that. And I invite you to do so. All for the sake of the other. To use your voice, to use the power, to use the wealth that you have. To live into this idea of sedekah for another person. To meet their needs. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for our time of prayer today, we're just going to use uh, a number of images and some words and some leading uh, sentences that will help you enter into a time of prayer. It's going to be a very poignant time for us to really sink into the nature of what's happened in our community over these last few weeks after the killing of George Floyd, and then also what we can do and be as we make our way forward. So use this time as a time of reflective prayer.
a reminder in the season of Pentecost that both the Greek and the Hebrew words for spirit mean spirit, but they also mean wind and breath. It's the very way that God is intimately involved, not only in making the world happen and recreating the world, but also becoming intimately connected with our life. Communion, what we celebrate now, is a gift of the Spirit and a way Christ is present in you and through you for the sake of the world. In the night when Jews betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
I'm so glad you're here with us at worship today. Uh, we all know that worship never keeps us in the space we are, whether that space is in our home or in a church building. Worship always leads us back into the world to participate as fully as we can with acts of justice. A couple things as far as announcements today. One is we prepared a, a statement on just why we are people of justice in the context of this congregation. Make sure that you look at that if you haven't received that by your email. It's important to have the big biblical background for us as we understand who God has invited us to be from the very beginning of a relationship to us in community. Uh, second thing is we also have given you many opportunities to serve. Uh, it was great. One of the things that happened on Wednesday of this or Thursday of this last week was that uh, we had five carloads of uh, items brought down to Bethlehem Lutheran Church for the work that they're doing. We find this is a very important time to be cooperative in ministry and to extend ourselves into the community. Make sure you hit all the lists that we have so that you know how you can serve, how you can give, and how you can volunteer. Those are the ways that we're going to actively make a difference in our world. Um, finally, uh, tonight there's going to be a prayer service, about a half an hour service. It's going to be on Facebook Live. We're also going to record it so that you have a chance to look at it the next day. Uh, so 6 o'clock tonight and Facebook Live. We want you to join us for that prayer service. And small groups are starting for the summer. Uh, they're focused on Renew Your Life, but they're going to take a specific uh, slant toward not only who we are as we struggle with uh, the pandemic and what that means for a new life for us these days, but also the reality of the world that we're living in uh, with this call for justice that is claiming uh, all of our lives, we hope. So lots of things happening, lots of ways that you can be involved in the life of this community. Uh, Jesus really, remember, never called us to make bigger and better churches. Jesus always has called us to not only imagine but co-create a better, more loving world. And we get to be a part of that. So listen to the words of Amos again. Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Thanks be to God.